Hello, everyone. Um, so this is my talk. So you're trying to support a medium-sized studio. So for clarification, I saw today the uh, description looked like there was a bad git, mer git merge happened. So there were two talks. Uh, one, I was previously working on the load time talk, and I got changed to this. It looks like the description went wonky there. So this is primarily about build tools, continuous integration, and uh, basically optimizing your throughput as a company, uh, not load times. But if I have time at the end, I've got load time, uh, a section I just want to quickly cover about hard and soft references. Uh, so fingers crossed if I blaze through this, I can talk about that because it's something I desperately want to share. Um, to begin, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Chris Murphy uh, for helping me sort out this talk, Puny Human, the folks I work for, and of course Epic Games uh, for allowing me to talk today. Uh, so who am I and why do you care about me? Um, I'm a gameplay programmer working, and, and a console lead uh, dev at Puny Human, working on Bardstale 4. Uh, previously worked on Kyo and Death Stare, so I work remotely from Canberra. And uh, they're both, both companies are based in the US. So this sort of uh, optimizing my throughput at home is very important to me. Uh, so as I just mentioned, I have a mild obsession with productivity uh, and how to improve it. Uh, that's in the sense that if I'm, someone asked me to do build tools as a day job, I would vehemently say no, but I do really like seeing uh, tools push and empower people, and like, especially through automation. And as it sort of covers it, love optimizing. So if there's anything I can do in the pipeline that can help the team, artists, programmers alike, that's tools, uh, it's uh, continuous integration, all fantastic for what I want to be doing. Uh, so today I'll be covering continuous integration, so I'll cover topics like Jenkins, uh, to discuss why I'll be picking Jenkins, uh, talking about various tools in Unreal's pipeline, so uh, yeah, UAT, UBT, and BuildGraph, which is a newer feature as of 4.13. Uh, the DDC, just to clarify what that is and how it benefits you and what you can do to uh, speed it up. Unreal Game Sync, which is a phenomenal tool, and if you're using Perforce, you need to be using UGS. I'd 100% recommend it, but I'll explain why later. Swarm, which is the lighting build system back end for Unreal, and talking about how you can uh, speed up your local uh, lighting build times. And then just briefly covering the automation tools in Unreal, uh, which I feel like a lot of people don't know about, but they're incredibly handy to use. Uh, well, like, can everyone hear me okay? Don't have any issues? Cool. Uh, so really, why, why do you care about this? Why would you want to focus on this? Why do you throw more meat sacks at the wall and hope you know, more people will help get your game out faster? The reality is that's not how it works. Uh, if any of you worked on even you know, a team more than three, you begin to realize that there is a uh, diminishing returns on how many people you can throw at a problem. And the main focus of this, uh, why you should care, is automating it so your uh, developer is aware faster of issues and they can fix it quicker. Uh, I'm a big champion of test-driven development. Uh, the focus there being basically uh, for every code that's submitted to your uh, version control system, it's tested by an automated tool and then immediately fed back to QA and given back to the developers as soon as possible. Rather than getting typically you know, your waterfall methods where you'd be uh, developing a uh, set of code for a long period of time. Three weeks later, you get the feedback that it's broken, something's wrong, and by that stage, you've moved on to other bits of code and you have no idea what you're doing. And obviously, the standard case is as a programmer, I look at my code three weeks ago, and I agree, what was I doing? Um, so typically, this is, I think, many of you are probably how you're packaging builds. Uh, fingers crossed you're actually doing it through command line, but I think a lot of you just go into the drag drop you know, package and Individually, that's okay. If you're just doing test projects, that's, you know, that's fine. But as you begin to grow, having every developer doing that locally and knocking them out while content cooks, while your shaders compile, while your game builds, is just slow, repetitive, and unnecessary. And it's just not feasible to expect developers to do this every time, on top of the fact that if they're trying to do, trying to do QA and you're in a small to medium-sized company and you don't necessarily have a huge amount of dedicated staff, uh, you're all working on the same version uh, there's no local modifications. So, so I started talking about continuous integration. So this is what I started talking about, or mentioned earlier, about submitting ver uh, code to version control, art assets, and then immediately getting a, a feedback response from some sort of automated system. It's a better way to basically scale your company as you grow, so you don't need more people. You just have more computers or more powerful computers. They can do it for you. So the too long didn't read of it, is cycle, the cycle of developers submitting work into version control and having it tested against an automated system. Uh, so I'm hoping with that statement you can see how valuable that is just alone. But the question is, how do I do that? 
And immediately I know some people are going to hear continuous integration, hear build tools, and be freaking out saying that's a lot of work. I'm, I'm just an artist. I don't know what I'm doing. A lot, of, a lot of what you can do is you can do in three steps. It's super easy to do. Jenkins is it's basically like plug and play, uh, set up a script, and you're good to go. So I just want to discuss the major three, in my opinion. Uh, so you've got Travis CI, Jenkins, and Team City. Uh, the typical ones I hear people using are Jenkins and Team City. I don't hear many people use Travis. Uh, I'm not particularly sure why that is. But I know that uh, for Travis, it's got nice, easy to use UI, but it's a bit pricey. Uh, so particularly if you're on a budget and games in general, are always potentially on a budget. So uh, it's really something to consider. And you can't host it on-premise unless you get the enterprise license, which is puts your costs up even higher. Jenkins is free. It's open source. And it has a metric shit ton of plugins. Uh, everything under the sun is available, basically, to you. Uh, I think there's very few cases where I have needed to try and write my, something myself. I can put a tweet up online, and someone's like, hey, I've got that. Here's, just, here's this repo. Uh, but the sad about part is documentation can be lacking. Because it's open source, there's a lot of people contributing, uh, and the documentation can lag behind. Team City, easy to configure. It's got a really nice UI, drag and drop. It's super effective. Uh, but the community is a bit smaller, I found, uh, in comparison to Jenkins. And the, it can be pricey depending on what you need, uh, what you need, sorry, and how it scales. So, for example, Team City, the professional server license is free. Uh, you get 100 build configurations and full access to all the products. Uh, but unfortunately, you only get three build agents. So, build agent in this circumstance can be Windows, Mac, Linux. So, if you have three different platforms you're deploying to, you're sort of maxed out there. If you do any, anything higher, um, so Jenkins is the one I've been using the most. Uh, and I love it to bits. I think it's fantastic. Uh, its UI has been incredibly outdated. It looks like something from the 90s, but with Blue Ocean, which I'd highly recommend downloading, it is certainly a step forward. Um, as I said, everything's free. Uh, Blue Ocean, you just go to the, the plugin section and just type away. It'll download for you and store everything it needs. Um, so just to, before we come back to Jenkins, I just want to talk about some of the build tools in Unreal and uh, talk about the basics and then talk about the more uh, extreme cases. So not extreme, I should say, but more advanced use cases with build graph. So the four commandlets, as they are, you've got UAT, which is Unreal Automation Tool. This is basically your one-stop shop for everything uh, automated in Unreal. So chances are this is what you'll be calling before executing anything else. Uh, you've got Unreal Build Tool. If any programmer, you've been dealing with this. I'm sure you've been dealing with the joys of uh, the code generation, how it compiles, et cetera, et cetera. You've got the UE4 editor, which you can use uh, if you pass up the correct parameters to diff and merge. And that'll open up the editor, as you guys have uh, used before, clearly. And then you've got UE4 editor command line. So this is just a, this is a literal commandlet for running certain tasks, like building of lighting or cleaning up of redirectors. So you can automate all of that. Um, so now we're just going to head over to Jenkins. And I was going to quickly show you how this all works. Oh, here we go. Don't mind. Sorry, one second. Come on. No, what are you doing? There we go. Alrighty, so this is your soon to be best mate Jenkins. Uh, you can download some of the Jenkins website. Uh, this is just, I think it's Jenkins.org, but if you just Google it, uh, download the Windows EXE, install it, it'll install everything it needs, and then it'll run a service in the background. Uh, so I've got a two, two uh, configurations here pre made. Uh, one at the top is just just me just having some fun. And the second one is uh, what I'm just going to expand upon in a second. So to get started, it's simple as clicking new item. You can enter a name, uh, my first proj, project, whatever. Uh, we can go freestyle. So your configuration options here, you've got freestyle project, Maven project, which is not really relevant for what we're doing, pipeline, multi-configuration, yada, yada. You can all read. Um, freestyle is what we're going to do now. Uh, pipeline's a more advanced. Uh, version of this, and I'll touch on it a little bit later. With Freestyle, what it allows you to do is just quickly drag and drop modules in. Uh, so you want to run batch scripts, you want to run uh, other commands. It's, it's super easy to do. Pipeline is a, is a more scripted circumstances. So if you're programmers out there and you really want to get down dirty and uh, organize how your build scripts are executed, it's really nice, uh, simple to use to a certain degree. Um, so this is your main view when you open up the Jenkins uh, configurator. Uh, the main thing we're looking for really is almost ignoring all of this and then adding a build step. We're going to go execute Windows batch command. And this is just running a, a basically CMD bat call and it'll run whatever you want. 
So here's something I whipped up later, which is the standard, uh, sorry, earlier, which is the standard build cook run command for Unreal. Uh, something special, if you run build cook run, so basically that, what the GIF you guys saw earlier with the file uh, package, that's build cook run. It'll cook your maps, it'll compile your project and produce an output. So what I've just done now is just grab the command line from that and just put it in here. Uh, so yeah, it's nothing special, just the standard. And now let's just hit apply, save. And with any luck, we hit build. And hopefully it'll go. So what this will do now, now for Jenkins, well, because it's an ongoing service, what we can do is configure it to actually run at certain periods of the day. So at home, I've configured it to whenever developers push a certain tag, that will compile it automatically for us and produce an output on our, my local server. In this circumstance, I've just got it set up so when you hit build now, it will compile, create the project, and you'll have it whenever you want it. A slightly more advanced inverted commas version is, as you can see earlier, um, sorry, back here, where we had it set up. Uh, was just using direct calls to the engine. Uh, nothing special, there's no parameters uh, in terms of configurable com uh, parameters on our end. It's just a direct call of the run UAT and then to the project, yada yada. What I've done here quickly is the exact same thing, except instead we're passing parameters and we can easily just pass in the engine path, the project path, etc. This is super useful if you've got multiple projects you want to compile to, different engine versions. Uh, for example, uh, because I do some plugin work uh, uh, for the marketplace, what I tend to do is set this up so it'll allow me to uh, compile multiple engine types all in one hit. Um, so that's just a brief overview of Jenkins. I don't want to go too depth into it because we could be here all day. And I'm sure you would rather be looking at the rest of the, the talk. Um, come on. Cool. So, I mean, that's fantastic. And yeah, it's just a command line call. It's nothing really exciting. But how can we make this better? What, what can we do to make this, I guess, more extensible for the end user? Because I feel like calling build cook run isn't going to be uh, necessarily accessible or user friendly for all your needs. So now we're going to look at build graph. So this is a fantastic tool that was brought into 4.13. Uh, basically, it's very much like the scripting language you get with uh, the scripted pipeline I mentioned earlier in Jenkins. But it's focusing more on the Unreal side of things and uh, the amount of tools available to you and sort of extending your tool set. So it's very similar to the makefiles I mentioned in the Jenkins pipelines. It's written in XML. And it basically consists of, consists of five core elements. Um, and all, you, all uses Unreal Build Tool to execute these. Uh, so you've got your build, craft, your build graph tasks. These are all basically just actions available to you. Uh, so you're, at the top, you've got the set, setting of the engine version, then compilation, tagging your files, and then a custom one committing. So it's, uh, as you can see, it's super easy to read. You understand what's going on, the parameters going in, and outputs coming out. Uh, these are a whole bunch of predefined tasks available to you in Unreal. Uh, you've got just a metric shit ton, really, of uh, cooking, compiling. You can call commandlets, so you could build lighting. You can uh, fix up versioning of files. You can remove symbols. So, for example, PDBs before you push a build to Steam, you can flag those and get them removed, stripped out. You can tag files, which is a nice way of uh, grouping file batches together. I'll show you in a second what I mean by that. Uh, and lastly, uh, of course, you can spawn extra processes. So if you want to do something outside of Unreal and execute other tasks, you can. You've got nodes, which are the grouping of the tasks. So I don't know if you're going to see here with a no name. That's basically what you'll be calling when you're invoking the build graph tools. It's compiling the, uh, in this case, it's compiling the required tools for UE4. So it's a shady compiler worker, light mass, Unreal pack, etc. You can see it produces an output, which is a hashtag symbol so the hash and then the UE4 required tools. What this allows you to do is that output will then be available anywhere in the build script, so you can reference those tag files later. This is super useful when you're trying to commit files to Git or you're trying to, for example, copy uh, certain files you want from an artifact, an output of a build, and uh, put them somewhere else. So in this case, we're, we're tagging all of them as UE4 required tools, and then later on I use them uh, to commit them to version control. Agents, this is very similar to what you'd get in Jenkins in terms of uh, identifying what's, uh, what server does what. So for example, a Windows server wouldn't be compiling for Mac. Uh, so you can tag your sections of code, uh, build graph code, to, particular, to only be available on that platform or that uh, node. Uh, you have aggregates. Aggregates are a nice way of basically an alias 
for a set of groups. So in this case, it requires the project editor, Win64, and the cook project. So before uh, the validate project will be executed, those requirements will be uh, fed. So it allows you to basically bulk batch a bunch of tasks together. And then you have properties. So this is, this is where it's super nice. You can pass in any properties you want, custom references, uh, and pass those to any of your scripts. And these are just like variables, really, in, uh, in any scripting language, any language. And then you also have options available. Options are basically getting environmental properties, environmental variables. As long as the option name matches the environment <laughs> variable, they'll be available to you in the script. One thing that's super uh, useful to note with build graph, I will say, is when you're compiling and you have a set of tasks together, so in this example here, we're compiling the shader, uh, shader compiler worker, Unreal Light Mass, Unreal Pack. Typically, as a programmer, when we're compiling, those will be executed individually rather than bulk batch together. What uh, build graph does, it batches them in one call, so you don't have the overhead of trying to invoke uh, MS build every time, which definitely, when you're doing a large number of tasks, certainly speeds it up. Uh, so now I'm just going to just show you a basic example of this in action. If I can get it working again. Boom. Is that readable? Can you see that at the back? Is it all good? Cool. I can zoom in if you want. Yeah. Okay, cool. What? <laughs> it certainly is. Um, so, uh, where are we? This is just a small example of uh, something that's available in Unreal. They have some examples in, uh, I think it's engine build and build graph, and then examples. Uh, so this basically here, all that's doing is just compiling Unreal header tool and then outputting the files uh, to the log, the message log. Uh, so as I mentioned before, you've got an agent. Specifically, its type is for uh, Windows 64 compilation. It won't be available for any nodes that are uh, Linux, Mac. It will just get ignored. Then, uh, then you see the node name. The node name, is, as I mentioned earlier, is what you'd be calling to invoke the uh, scripting behavior and what will be compiled uh, on Unreal build, sorry, uh, build Graph's end. And of course, the actual logging and then just finishing it up. The aggregate there is basically just, a, as I said, an alias mentioned earlier for the uh, header tool. It's not doing anything special in this example. But moving on to a more advanced version, this is what I use at work. Um, for compiling our code for artists. So the gist of it here is when invoking this, this gets called every time a code is submitted to version control. The output, uh, it changes the version number, compiles the editor based on uh, properties passed in, tags a bunch of files, and those files are committed to Git. Uh, as I said, this is what, five, six lines, and it does all of that in one easy to use uh, command. Whereas in, if I was doing this in batch or bash, it'd be a uh, lot more difficult task. And particularly with the tagging outputs, it allows me to just grab the files I need and nothing more, and I don't have to do any filtering afterwards, which is something I typically would have to do. Um, now, I guess back to here. Cool. So, talking about invocation, uh, Basically how we're uh, calling this command, it's just, just called run UAT. So this is the Unreal Automation tool I mentioned earlier. You pass in the build graph command and then the script as well as the target. The target is a node I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so basically in that case it was compile editor win64. And the script would be wherever the script lives in your repository. Uh, they, there's an example of it there. Nothing crazy, it's all super simple to use. Uh, but I'd highly recommend looking into it. So then you have parameters. These are parameters I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's just as simple as passing in set, the parameter name, and then a value. This applies to all property, uh, property types. Uh, if you pass in a, if it's expecting a Boolean value and you give it a, tr a, a string, it'll fail in, uh, uh, during the invocation, uh, resulting in an error in the build graph. So you'll see it's pretty obvious. Uh, likewise with the call again, it's just super simple. Just call set, give it the variable name, and then a property. Uh, custom tasks. So just an example of that, I mentioned there was a git commit task. That's something custom for us because Unreal doesn't use Perforce. Uh, was on a, the project I was using this for, sorry, and Unreal does use Perforce and doesn't use Git. Um, so, uh, where are we? The custom task here, super simple to use. You basically create a task inheriting from custom task. You need to place this script in uh, Unreal Automation Tool and then Build Graph Tasks. 
Uh, you tag it with a task element. A task element matches the name you want to be typing in the build graph script. So in this case, git commit. And then parameters you want to be using that the, uh, the user is required to pass through. Uh, in here, the execution is where the, the chunk of the code, uh, the work comes from. Everything in here that's just going on really is just grabbing the list of files, separating them out, and doing a batch call to git. Uh, so I don't have to commit them one by one, as it's a slow and I'll just task. Um, back to our, oh no, what have I done? Proust through it. Oh God. Um, and we're back. So other examples can be found, as I mentioned, for in the build graph examples folder. Uh, next up, you can find them in the installed, uh, in, sorry, the build folder installed engine build. I'll be covering that in a second. And then in shooter game. So in 4.18, they added a script and, uh, that'll show you how they use it in shooter game. Uh, that's for compilation of the project, both uh, for creating a target, so a package, or for just uh, cooking, I believe, as well. So I just mentioned that there's an installed engine build. Uh, for some of you, if you've used this in the past, this was previously known as rocket, uh, the rocket command, so dash rocket when you were compiling uh, your project. This would effectively create a standalone engine instance for you, uh, effectively how the editor is built for the launcher. There's a script already provided by an Unreal, as I mentioned before, and it builds uninstalled engine folder. This, you run that command, you tell it uh, what platforms you want to build for, and it'll package the engine up as if it was ready for deployment on the, uh, the launcher. This is super handy if you're wanting to, if you don't modify the engine often, and you just want to give the, uh, the end user, so your developers, a engine that's ready to go, don't need to compile any shaders, yada yada, it's, it works excellently out of the box. But it takes a really long time to build. So it does DDC generation as well, uh, so that's all your shaders, files, uh, content types, on top of the already existing uh, work it has to do with compiling for all platforms. Next up is Unreal Game Sync. So this is just the most beautiful thing when I discovered it. Uh, what this tool is, Chris covered it briefly yesterday. What it is is basically a graphical front end for syncing your UE4 projects uh, from Perforce. So if you're not using Perforce, you're out of luck, I apologize. You could potentially uh, do a rewrite. I did look into this for Git, but it's not really worth it. I'm just gonna let you know now. Um, so it handles syncing, resolving of merge conflicts, which is really nice as a programmer, where I can just sync and then it'll auto handle it as much as possible, uh, rather than Perforce would typically go, you need to sort this out, it's just a one line fix. Um, it updates the engine version, which is super handy if you're doing local builds to know what you're building against, and starts up the engine, which is optional. Uh, additional features, it has a launcher. The great thing about this is uh, if you provide the launcher to the end user, uh, once installed, every time it boots up, it'll check for a latest version of Unreal Game Sync. So it means that if, I'm, if I want to make some improvements personally, I can uh, submit the Unreal Game Sync version to our version control. It will automatically pull it down, update, and everyone gets it. Uh, it also has a metadata server for tracking uh, compilation results, comments, and reviews for each change list. That sounds like a small thing, but it is incredibly useful for, in terms of uh, development flow. It allows, if you briefly look at, the, look at it here, uh, for each one of those change lists, each one of those will have can potentially have reviews, comments, likes, dislikes, inverted commas, so the smiley up and down faces, oh, you can't see them there. But uh, the great thing about it is if I submit some code and something's gone wrong, I can really just get uh, a response from developers on top of my uh, build machine yelling at me that I've broken something. Um, so the benefits of programmers. So as I said, easy syncing and compilation to target changeless. Uh, there's nothing more arduous than having to sync from Perfor, in my opinion, because I did this, obviously did this daily having to sync from Perforce and a separate app, then open up Unreal, generate the project files again, and then compile. This does it all for you, handles it, it's fantastic. Uh, there's global flags indicating the status of a CL, uh, sorry, change list, sorry, including comments, as I mentioned. So when you submit some code, uh, or someone else has some, submitted some code, you can get some comments and feedback directly on there, rather than having to jump back and forth between, you know, Jira or Trello or whatever else you use. It has local versioning, you build version and uh, build that version file and your version or header file, so that'll allow you to uh, quickly see what changes you're on, and if you do a package locally, uh, you can actually see the, the correct result. Uh, and it allows you to do custom build targets. So, for example, I use Unreal front end a lot because I'm doing a lot of uh, console development. So, Unreal front end, if you're unaware, is the front end for profiling, for uh, monitoring, for uh, automation tools. It's basically a one stop shop for all of that. 
Uh, I've set that up as a separate target after it compiles all the requires, uh, required files. So that includes the editor, includes light mass, and includes the shady compiler worker. After that, completes my custom builds. So it means the moment, the moment I'm done, I'm full synced from Perforce, I've got everything I need ready to go. For artists and designers, it's, as I said, super easy to sync to target change lists. Um, going back to here, you can see, oh my God, so slow. There you go. So each one of those, as I said before, is a change list. It allows you to choose exactly what you want and what you don't want, uh, which means that if I know someone coming up is about to push a four, four gig update to a map and I really don't want to touch that, I can, I'll know immediately, rather than syncing from Perforce and wondering why the hell I'm still sitting here an hour and a half later. Uh, waiting for this file to complete. Um, I'll, I'll, it gives you the option as well to sync compressed editor targets, so a zipped package of the editor. So what this means, as Chris briefly touched on yesterday, is that when, uh, if you set it up correctly in uh, your continuous, uh, continuous integration system, the editor can be compiled, the binaries can be zipped up and then pushed to wherever you want, and Unreal Game Sync can pull that down. So rather than everyone having to pull down binary files, each update, or each change list, only the artists get the required files and get those files delivered to them in a zip. For production and QA, the comments and review system, it means that you've got one area to be looking in rather than, I know personally that it's, it's sp normally spread out between your chat program like Slack, spread out between your Jira or Perforce, all those tools, instead of having one stop for it and you know exactly where everything is. Uh, it's, I found, uh, particularly working with QA, this is incredibly handy to use and uh, if rather than us having to have a conversation online uh, or offline, an email or uh, Slack, I can just, just go there and know immediately where, where, where we're at with the problems. Uh, post, post bad status program, which is a separate application in the Unreal Game Sync uh, solution folder, allows for your CI results to be submitted. So what this means really is that when I submit some code, at the moment the build machine starts cooking off and compiling and letting me know what's going, uh, sorry, as it starts getting that ready, if it fails, it'll immediately push a notification to my computer and let me know that it broke on your CL. So that immediately there is fantastic to see rather than typically the use case would be Jenkins would email certain developers and then that developer would no notify you. But removes that extra step and immediately and just means that you can see that if you screwed up and you can fix it before anyone else sees it. Um, so deployment options I mentioned earlier, uh, you can just compile the Unreal Game Sync application uh, it's available in your engine root folder, uh, source programs, Unreal Game Sync. This, this is the C Sharp project. There's multiple sub projects in it, uh, in the solution. You just compile Unreal Game Sync. Typically, what I started off doing originally uh, for my previous company was we just used to store that into Dropbox and then, because I barely updated it, and people would pull, uh, pull it down, install it, and just, just do it that way. But the preferred version, because I, once I started uh, change, making some modifications to it, is you can download and install it. And as I said before, it'll, uh, once installed, every time it boots up, as in your computer boots up or Unreal Game Sync boots up, it'll pull the latest version, update it for you, and it's all seamless. Um, so the build system integration, as I said before, is post bad status. It's an EXE you can compile in the Unreal Game Sync solution folder, uh, solution, sorry. Or there's also a build graph task call. Uh, it's super easy to use. You basically pass it the change list it's working against, the developer who is working on, and uh, the metadata server that it's, uh, it's using for logging. Uh, as I mentioned before, once, once it's called from the uh, Jenkins, for example, it'll be notified immediately to the, develop to the corresponding developers who created this, uh, worked on the, uh, uh, the CL. It links, links directly to the build log information, which is even better because it means the moment I get a notification saying I broke it, I can hit the link, the uh, URL it has, I can see where it broke, whether it was a cook, whether it was a compilation failure, what, what it was. Uh, using combination with the metadata server, as I mentioned earlier, you're in for a really good experience. Uh, all this in combination together just means that you don't really have to be going left, right, and center and talking to a lot of people um, because I've always found that there's a miscommunication uh, once you have too many layers of abstraction there. Uh, currently, Unreal Games thing you don't have to use as a big uh, development studio. So for example, I do a lot of remote work and if clients are working in Perforce but they haven't gotten Real Game Sync set up, I still prefer to use it because it's sort of, as I said, it's a super nice way to track what change list I'm on. Uh, it tells me, it just compiles everything for me because I'm lazy. I can just hit sync or schedule syncs once every hour. Uh, it also means that 
as I mentioned before, when there's a super large sink that's coming in, someone submitted some you know, shaders that I've they've, they've changed the master material and I've got 40,000 shaders compiled. I can avoid that till tomorrow morning and it's, it's a then problem rather than our problem. Um, Unreal Swarm. So Unreal Swarm, you've probably, if you've ever uh, built lighting in Unreal, then chances are you've used Unreal Swarm without, your, without knowing it. Uh, but one thing I think a lot of, I don't know how many people know this, but you can build lighting over the network. It's super easy to set up, and once you get it working, it's just, just delightful. Uh, previous game I worked on, Kieru, black and white ninja game, uh, because it's purely based on light and dark. We were baking a lot of lights, and it took a very long time with one computer. So what we did is set up uh, all our computers on the network, all our developers, while we're not using it heavily. So while I wasn't compiling, while I was just in the editor, it would, in the background, just help the, help the lighting build. Um, it's just a standard master-slave setup. There's nothing spe special or crazy about the system. So you have uh, one coordinator installed on a persistent PC of some sort, and that PC uh, is just uh, controlling who, who and what is doing the lighting builds. And then you have uh, plenty of agents on as many PCs as you want. And as mentioned, uh, you deploy the coordinator to a persistent PC. It's a virtual machine, build machine, or a laptop. In our office, we just had a really... Uh, simple, basic laptop that is sat there just doing dumb tasks, uh, and it would uh, be handling and coordinating this for us. You just all you have to do is set its group, tell it that it's you know your your company's group because you're going to have multiple subgroups. For example, if you have uh, separate projects, you know, for example, with Epic, Fortnite, uh, Paragon, Rip. Uh, you got then you got to set the swarm agents. Super easy to do. You just set in the configuration. You set the co uh, the coordinator's IP address. And then you set the group, and basically the next time you hit uh, build lighting, as long as the coordinator is set up correctly, it'll just handle it for you. Uh, and then, yeah, reap the rewards of finite power. I'm not going to say infinite because there's definitely there's a limit, but it'll certainly help you. Uh, I just want to give some tips as well for lighting and build times. Uh, I know I see a lot of people just sort of saying, I, when I build my lighting, it takes 30 days. I don't know why. And then you ask them, it's like, oh, okay, because my light mass resolution on objects is you know, 8K, and I have three and a half thousand lights in this one corner. Um, so, one thing, actually, this is a big one I see a lot as well is light mass important volumes. Um, these are what they allow you to do basically is you, uh, you put it over an area and it'll focus the photons, inverted commas in Unreal's terms, of uh, how accurate the lighting information is. And it's, it's really nice if you have a particular area you want nice lighting in, uh, be high quality. But I see a lot of people just basically grab this box and go, well, my game's important, so I'll just put the whole thing over it. It, doesn't, it makes it redundant. It just gives you uh, longer build times unnecessarily. So if you focus on placing those volumes in areas that matter, you're going to have a good time. Uh, next up, uh, static meshes also have, uh, if they have a high lap, well, light map resolution, will definitely massively increase your build times. Noting between light, uh, sorry, static meshes and the, uh, the basic cubes, I forgot the name. Do you know the name, Troy? Uh, yeah, the BSPs, uh, thank you. So the BSPs have like, I don't know why, but the inverse of the resolution. So this, the smaller it is, the more, uh, the higher res it is. Whereas static meshes will typically be the higher res they are, the higher res they are. Um, so if you can reduce, them, reduce the complexity of those and how many uh, actors you have near a light, once again, you're gonna be better off. <laughs> uh, folders tools uh, are actually something you should be super cautious about is because the instant static meshes that are used by the folder system automatically use the light map resolution of that static mesh. So if you're placing thousands or tens of thousands of trees, grass on, in your area, your, your light map times are just going to go just absolutely through the roof. Uh, we had that very quickly when we were trying to paint an area and our artists were just having a good time, like, God, how good does this grass look? I'm like, yeah, it does, but look at the build times. We're like three days in and it's still 5%, so let's can that. Um, reducing the amount of shadow casting actors and lights in general, I mean, that's, that's an obvious one. Just reduce the amount of shadows, ergo, there's less things to build. Pretty standard, straightforward. And of course, just throwing more CPU power at it. Um, I think a lot of, I do hear a lot of confusion sometimes of people thinking that light mass is GPU-based. It's not, it's CPU heavy. Uh, however, there's a guy on the forums, if um, some of you may have seen, who's working on a GPU light mass implementation. It's looking pretty good so far, but I'm skeptical when it's just some random on the internet. Um, hashtag dealing with Rama. Um, if any, yeah, sorry, I've got a lot of issues with Rama, a lot of hatred there. Uh, and 
of course, more RAM, higher clock speeds, more cores, always gonna have a good, good time uh, trying to be build times there. Briefly want to touch on the automation system on Unreal. It's another, it's another tool in your UE4 toolbox that a lot of people don't seem to be using. Uh, look, I'd love to be using it more, but at the end of the day, how much time I'm allocated at work versus how much time I can justify doing unit tests for is normally doesn't weigh up. However, there is a number of uh, areas you can still use this tool for outside of that. So the available features uh, for, the, uh, for the automation system, you can do unit tests, which is API like level verifications, so making sure your code uh, executes the way exactly the way you want it. You got features, so the idea here is really like verifying that Pi still works. Uh, if you guys have ever built large games, you'll know at some point in the future that the Pi will just stop working and you have no idea why and you just, and I think, look, admittedly, most of the time I just walk with it. I'm like, whatever, I'll just go like stand alone, I'll deal with it. Six months later, I have so much regret because I just wish Pi would work. Uh, so this is setting this up and like another prime example is ver verifying in-game stats or make sure resolution changes work. Uh, it's, it's really simple and implement and something that should be done. Uh, smoke tests, uh, considered by Unreal to be something that's super quick. They should take less than a second to complete. And the idea is that every time you open the editor, these smoke tests will be executed. So you know immediately that if you pull the CL and everything's broken that the smoke test failed and we'll explain why. Uh, content stress test, and this is something that I think, I don't know why more people aren't doing, is the idea being just basically doing like a camera fly through of your game, loading lots of levels, loading lots of assets. There are, there's tools built into Unreal to measure this and profile it and let you know and give you immediate feedback. And then the screenshot comparison tool, which I'm about to touch on, which uh, if, you, if any graphics programmers out there or artists who are really just nitpicky about their art, this tool is exceptionally uh, well built and should be something that just comes part of your toolbox. So the screenshot comparison tool is part of the Unreal front-end interface. Um, it's easy to use and allows your QA teams to quickly verify uh, visual regressions or issues between two builds. So what it allows you to do, it gives you uh, image A, image B, and it basically does an A-B test against those images and sees what's, uh, what's different. Uh, quite often, we, we, I use that a little bit for Kiero, especially doing a black and white game if there's any other colors. Sounds odd, but somehow colors would sneak into the game. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that uh, across the scene that we have none of those issues. And it's BP exposed, so there's no excuses. A lot of the automation systems I just talked about, we, you're gonna need programmers. It's all C++ heavy. But the screenshot comparison tool has blueprint stuff exposed to it. So if there's anyone out there who's like, ah, I'm a blueprinter, I can't do this, that's a lie and you're lying to yourself. So you should be doing it. Um, so there are two types of uh, actors to use for the screenshot tools. You've got the UI screenshot test actor. Uh, so as its name implies, uh, when it takes a screenshot, it takes a screenshot of your UI and allows you to do uh, content diffing of uh, your user interface. And then of course the functional tool. So this is a scene capture, a scene view capture of uh, whatever scene's in front of you and a little in front of it. Uh, and allows you to just do a diff between those two images. But I will note, it does, it is affected by post-process volumes. Uh, sorry, it has its own post-process settings. So you definitely wanna try and line up those post-process settings with your player settings, just to make sure you're one-to-one -one and you're not wondering why this one looks like Michael Bay and this one doesn't, and it's like no bloom. Um, as I've gone through multiple times. Uh, data derived cache. So this is the DDC I was referring to earlier. Um, if you've ever seen this joyous compiling shaders, this is what's happening. Your, da your data derived cache is getting sorted up. Uh, and you'll definitely remember it and you'll hate the one person who pushes a master material change and ever everyone in the studio you hear the as they realize there's 40,000 shaders to compile and have to deal with it, uh, which is not fun for anyone. But you can set this up to work over the network. So if you're working in a big studio and you don't have a shared DDC, uh, set up, as soon as you get home tonight, I know you've got to go to the Agdas, set this up because it doesn't take long at all. Uh, basically, as I said, the DDC stores out of versions of the assets uh, used by various formats. So for Xbox, you know, PS4, PC, shaders will be compiled for those particular platforms and stored in the DDC. Um, as I mentioned, it's a right pain in the ass if it's not used or set up correctly. So the other side of that is if you set up a shared DDC, life is great. So what this allows you to do is there's a one shared DDC for everyone on the network. So the first person who boots up Unreal and gets the hit in the morning of the 40,000 shaders, he's your man, he's sorting you out, he's a good guy. Uh, because now, when you, when you boot up your computer, you're fine, everything's great. You've got all the shaders, you've got everything you need. As I said, easy to set up, you just go to your default engine INI. 
There's a derived data backend graph section there. It should already be filled out. If not, you can go to the Unreal documentation uh, for this article to share DDC, and I'll show you how to do it. And then you just change it to point to the network share. Uh, or you can set up a custom environment variable uh, for the data cache path. Now, I recommend this if you're doing the second option, if you're doing remote work, because when I change the default I and I uh, for, for a client, I overwrite their end, and they're going to get mad because now everyone has to compile each shader individually. Uh, so moving on, I mentioned that the first person who boots up in the morning has to deal with the compiling of all the shaders and the derived data cache uh, joys that come with that. But there is a way you can skip that using Jenkins. Uh, and just I don't even need to use Jenkins, just a simple command line call. So you just call the ue4editor.exe, you pass your project name or the u project path, run the drive data cache command with fill. So what this, is, what, what this will do is it will completely and utterly uh, compile your data drive cache for all the platforms that you require and fill, up, fill the shaders up as required. Uh, because I work remotely and there's a big team we're doing optimizations at the moment, this is super crucial for me to do because waking up first thing in the morning, as I mentioned again and again, if I see 30,000 shaders to compile, I'm going to go out for breakfast and I'll be back in an hour because I'll be here all day. So I run this on my build machine about two hours before I get up for work. Uh, and by the time I get up, and everything's all good to go. It's, everything's all set up correctly. And then when I compile for separate platforms, it's, I don't have to wait on shaders to compile. Um, I just want to give some additional tips. Uh, so if you're working with Perforce, uh, I'd really recommend setting up a proxy server. Uh, as I don't know how many of you are doing remote work for uh, Unreal development, especially programmers. but if you don't set up a proxy server, you're in for a really bad time because you'll be taking days and days to be pulling work from someone else remotely. Uh, you don't need a big, heavy PC to do this. You're going to set up a laptop uh, that has just got a big hard drive and you just run a service. Or rather than pointing to the client's uh, Perforce server, you instead point to this cache. Uh, and when you pull next, it'll fill that cache correctly for you. And then any time you need to grab some change lists from before or after, it'll be pulling over the local network rather than the internet. So you can definitely see there's a dramatic increase in times there. And once again, if you're using combination with Jenkins, uh, you can use the P4 proxy load sync function, which sounds super weird, but what it does is it syncs the files and doesn't put them on disk on the server. Uh, so it doesn't create a, uh, a client. It just syncs it, and the next time you pull, as I said, over the local network. Uh, UE4 tips. I regularly run the reset packages commandlet. So I'm sure many of you have dealt with the joys of uh, fix up redirectors or someone deleting a file and then not fixing up redirectors. Uh, running this command will do that automatically for you. Uh, so that's just running the UE4 editor, the exe, running reset packages, passing fix up redirectors, and uh, the, the auto checkout uh, will mean that the moment it uh, saves that file, we'll check it out, and then when it's all finished, it'll submit it for you. So running this, I, I run this uh, for other projects on the weekend. So once a week, just doing it at the end of the week, and you don't have any issues, particularly later in the line, when you're trying to cook or compile uh, for various platforms. I would seriously consider automating as much as you can. Lighting builds is a big one. Uh, you can build lighting separately outside of the editor. You don't have to be an editor to do this. So you run a command line for it. Uh, you can be doing it overnight when no one's in the office. And all that means your computers are uh, amply available for it. And performance profiling. Uh, now the, you know, you've got sequencer and you've got the automation profiling tools. It's super easy to do fly through cameras of your game. There's no real, it's not a hard task to do. You can set up sequencer in you know, half an hour to do this. And then the automation system in another half hour after that. Uh, that's something that should definitely be considered. Uh, and programmers, if you want to look for just a simple, easy way to grab some uh, performance data uh, without having to grab them all individually, you can use performance data consumer in uEngine. Uh, so there's a add performance consumer and remove. So the add, basically, what it allows you to grab is basically GPU, CPU, RAM, everything under the sun information from your project uh, quickly and easily. Uh, it's not super extensible, but if you just want to grab that information and use it in your automation and profiling tests, it's easy to do. Uh, now, I just want to say I'm not getting paid to promote this. Epic has not told me to do this, but if you're a medium-sized studio and you're looking to build your next project, I'd highly recommend looking into UDN. Not because of the, the costs that's reduced or not because of the, you know, uh, the subsidies you get. It's 100% for the uh, developer interaction with the Unreal developers who are working on the systems you're having issues with. 
Uh, I've only got access to UDN this year, and when I did, it was like a life-changing holy grail because it allows you just, as I said, you have to get a response in 48, uh, I think within 48 hours. Uh, and that you're talking to the person who worked on the system for you. Thank you. Uh, so I had a prime example is I had an issue with some physics engine, uh, sorry, it's a physics crash, put up the post online, and the guy who actually wrote the line of code reported back to me and worked with me to try and fix the issue. Uh, as said, what I want to emphasize again, not paid by Epic to promote this, but it's seriously useful if you're a medium-sized studio and you can afford it. Um, so in conclusion for this section, if you've got 15 minutes left, I believe, I can hopefully go through some load time stuff, as Sammy promised in the weird description. Uh, but you don't have to be an engineer to get started with a continuous integration. It's super easy to do. Anyone can do it. Jenkins is easy to set up. Uh, there's a lot of tutorials online for it as well. You don't need an expensive build machine. A, ba if you have, a lot of people have spare computers, old computers. There's something that gets it off your machine. As a developer, you're not sitting there having to wait for a build, cook, lighting, anything to finish. You can just dump it on someone else's system. That's fantastic. Um, sending time to set up automation now will save you a lot of time in the long run. Uh, days and days it would have uh, saved me, uh, particularly on the project I'm working on at the moment. And embrace test-driven development. That is, that is the dream, is just using test-driven all day, every day. Um, for more info, there's a whole bunch of stuff on my website uh, about Build Graph. You can definitely find some more Jenkins libraries and scripts I've written on my GitHub. And there's plenty of information available online. Uh, now the documentation has been updated severely in uh, 14, uh, 418, 19, and 20. Uh, next slide is going to say questions, but we're skipping that. I'm merely going to something I want to rant about. So I know uh, some of you guys saw the talk description. It said something about load times. That was my previous talk, but then I got asked to do this talk more recently. Uh, I did this talk at NZGDC, but this is a super condensed version. So I just want to talk about what hard refs are. Hard refs and soft refs are real. These are really big killers for big projects, and I think it's still relevant to this talk. So a hard reference is, will cause an object. Uh, so a hard reference basically is a reference to an asset, reference to other objects uh, in the level, or assets like skeletal messages, uh, images. So when a hard reference is put into a class of any sort in Unreal, uh, when, that, when the outer object's CDO, that's the class default object, is loaded, that will be loaded as well. So what it means is if you have a VFX actor that's got a bunch of particle effects attached to it, or that you know, uh, particle effects systems, images, and they're all hard refs, the moment that actor is loaded, boom, like you just loaded that entire system into memory. Um, it's also a big cause of circular dependency chains. Uh, if you worked in Unreal long enough, and especially in Blueprints, and you've booted up one day and it says, it gets the 72% and just sits there, and nothing happens, and then nothing happens, and then it crashes, that's most likely a circular dependency chain. So you've got a blueprint A referencing blueprint, blueprint B, and blueprint B is referencing blueprint A. And then when Unreal tries to load it, it just goes into a little kerfuffle. kerfuffle. So uh, to understand object loading, the CDO, the class default object, is loaded at the startup of your game for C++ classes. That's every single C++ class is loaded at the startup. Um, blueprint classes are loaded on demand. So when a blueprint class is referenced, then it'll be loaded. And, and its CDO will be loaded. Remember this for later because this is super important. Uh, your objects and class, these, these are the, your, your hard references. So object and class properties are both hard references. So although that the top one is a reference to a class, in Blueprints when it's compiled, it needs to know about the full information of that actor. So when this Blueprint's loaded and it has a reference to this actor, it needs to load that entire thing. Um, a prime example of this being a problem is we had in Bardsdale uh, a particular actor on the scene that was just doing basic line trace checks and it happened to reference a subsystem of ours for puzzles. Uh, the unfortunate scenario of that was the moment that object's loaded, it loaded this entire subsystem of puzzles, including uh, models, meshes, images, yada, yada, and we were immediately seeing an increase of 300 megs of just random usage just from this object just, just existing in a scene. Uh, other asset ref types are textures and static meshes. Oh, oh my god. Uh, also, function input and output pins, they're still references. Uh, big thing to remember, because variables are super easy to find, but having input and output pins might be a bit more of a pain in the ass later. Um, and arguably the most painfully used node, and once I've realized how bad this node is, I've been reading every, uh, every day since, is casting. Uh, I'd, everyone, every, every person on the planet is usually for abusers' casts, and 
We all go through that stage of realisation that this is actually a terrible thing. But I will say, one way to get around the casting to, is to cast a C++ class. Don't cast a Blueprint class. Um, because the C++ class is already loaded, you don't have to get extra overhead of when the, the, blueprint, uh, the blueprint that has the cast in it gets loaded. It doesn't have to worry about anything else. It already exists in memory. So uh, how do we get around all this? Uh, what, sort of, what sort of options do we have available to us? Interfaces. These are something that I think a lot more people should be using. They're conceptually the same as the C++ interface, but they feature reflection support. Um, they're implementable in C++ and Blueprints, so it's not you don't need programmers for it, it's just the concept in Unreal. And it allows you to promote abstract behavior. So rather than directly referencing a class, you can say, hey, if you implement this function, do it. If not, ah, ignore it, don't worry about it. Uh, move it to C++. Uh, this has been a big win for a lot of, especially because when I came onto the project, uh, we were doing a lot of things wrong uh, when it comes to this, the hard refs. So an easy win for us is rather than trying to separate all the hard refs out, was just referring to a base class in C++ instead of a blueprint class. As I said, C++ classes are loaded at startup, so it's an easy win. Um, soft references, this is another big fix and you should be using them as much as possible. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, when a class is loaded, the objects, the owning objects, class default object is loaded. The first property, let's say it's a texture, it's loaded. Its second one is a blueprint class, it's loaded. And then, because it's a blueprint class, anything in that, uh, in that class's properties will get loaded as well. So you end up with this daisy chain of loading infinite, or not infinite, but uh, a large amount of assets. <laughs> um, oh, come on. Uh, property three. So let's say this property is a soft reference to a texture 2D. It is skipped because you have to manually load the objects. So soft objects and blueprints, just to show you what the pins look like, and if you recognize them, you go, ah, yeah, I've used that. Um, you've got the loading of the assets, so you've got async load asset and async load class asset. These are both available in blueprints, super easy to use. Uh, and, but remember they're latent actions, meaning that you can't use them in functions, so they're only available in the event graph. Uh, soft objects in C++, you've got the soft object path, you've got the soft object pointer. Uh, prior to 418, it was named asset pointer. Uh, soft class path, and that was previously, uh, sorry, soft class path, and then you've got soft class pointer, which was previously referred to as T asset subclass of. Um, loading C++, you've got the asset manager, uh, which I don't think I'll have time to touch on for this talk, but if, you, if you're looking, if you're doing an RPG with lots of, lot, uh, lots of inventories, multiple items, really, really, really look into the asset manager. It's the most beautiful system of just uh, abstractly loading large amount of assets. You've got a streamable manager, which has the requesting of the async load and requesting a sync load. So async being uh, doesn't have to happen, happen immediately, comes back a frames later. Uh, soft object path, it's just try load. That's a synchronous call, so it'll, it'll load immediately. You've got soft object pointer or soft class pointer. That's your load synchronous as well, so that's loading immediately. Uh, C++ loading tips. So references that are set in C++ do not generate a cooker reference. So if, you're, if you've ever been doing the, uh, yeah, con uh, the constructor helpers, object finder or class finder, and you package your game and they're not there, and you're like, why the hell, it's referenced, it's, it should be there. Uh, the cooker reference is not generated for those assets. Uh, it is a semi-bug on a real end. I've reported it for another class type. Uh, for example, soft object pointers, you can set their, their path. But it's something they're not looking to fix in the near future. On that note, if you are using constructor, uh, yeah, constructor helpers like object finder or class finder, just remove them. Please do, just, just delete them, just pretend they don't exist. Because as I mentioned, when the class default object is loaded, those assets will be in memory as well. So if you have a, a class that's referencing lots of images in C++ in the constructor, those will remain for the lifetime of your uh, project or the instance of your game. So you're potentially having lots of images sitting in memory the entire time, not being used. Uh, things to note. Soft references just defer when the asset's loaded. Uh, you, uh, so that doesn't mean you can just turn everything to a soft reference and you're all hunky-dory, yay, I've got nothing in memory, but you also got nothing loaded, so it doesn't really count. Uh, so converting everything to a soft ref isn't gonna make your life easier, it'll make it harder. You really should be planning your assets, not just your game. So the idea there being basically that if you have, I mentioned earlier, a VFX actor with lots of art assets in it, super heavy uh, in terms of its memory footprint, Rather than making everything inside that a soft asset pointer, make whatever refers to it a soft pointer. And so that means you can just load that and it'll load everything you need at once. 
if you have an object like a, your character and he's got a couple things that references, uh, you know, an image that's only used in one level or an image that's only used in the menu, consider making that a soft pointer rather than a uh, hard ref. And that's it. So I blitzed through that. I apologize. But if you have any questions, do we have time for questions? Sick. Any questions? And thank you very much for listening to my talk.